Tokenizers are a key component of large language models. Any input prompt that is sent to a large language model first needs to go to a tokenizer. The tokenizer takes the input text and it breaks it down into individual pieces. These pieces are either words or parts of words. Model builders need to pay close attention to tokenizers to enable models to do a better job at tokenizing certain datasets. But what makes tokenizers different? In this video, we'll glance at several trained tokenizers for popular large language models. These are both generalized as well as specialized LLMs. We will look at GPT-2, GPT-4, BERT, Starcoder, and a few more models. This video follows a simple structure. We have one text that we carefully crafted for this, and we'll pass this same text to the different tokenizers, and from their different behaviors, we will learn a few of the things that make different tokenizers different. And by extension, we'll see what this tells us about the model that consumes it after the tokenizer. If you want to learn more about tokenizers and large language models in general, check out our book, Hands-On Large Language Models. To learn more about it, check out the links in the description. Now let's look at these tokenizers. All right, so this is our notebook. I don't want you to focus on all of this boilerplate. This is the piece of text that through passing it to different tokenizers, we'll learn quite a bit about tokenization. We can take a quick look at it right now. It says English and capitalization. So a capital letter, letter here and an all cap word here. We have an emoji, we have a Chinese character, we have a few different code words. So these are all Python. And then we have two tabs and four spaces. Uh, we'll see what this tells us. And then we have some numbers here. Now, this is the function we defined up here. Uh, basically, we, we give it the same the text and we give it the model and it will instantiate that tokenizer and tokenize this text based on this tokenizer. So let's start with this one. So this is BERT base uncased. Two things that this function does. First, it just outputs the tokens that the model breaks down the text into. So we can see it up here. So that's me scrolling to the end. So a few things to notice. The model added this special token CLS to the beginning and adds SAP or separator to the end. That's part of the BERT uh, behavior. One thing to notice is that we lost the new lines here. So no more new lines. We can see that these two characters, the emoji and this Chinese character, which is stands for bird, I believe, uh, are now replaced by unknown. So the model now has lost two pieces of information. It has no access to. It cannot see new lines and it cannot see these two characters. And in here, we'll, we're just printing every token that the model is, that the tokenizer is outputting. Because this is an, an uncased model, we can see that we lost the capitalization here. So English is not capitalized and capitalization is also not capitalized. And you can think of that as also the model losing some information that could be useful for some use cases. So if you're doing tasks like maybe named entity recognition, you can benefit from capitalizations of names, for example, or city names. That's information that can be useful. And also if you're doing something like a chat model, New lines are important because that's usually how we separate dialogue, for example. They encode some of that information. And then this model, this tokenizer, you know, lost some of that information that the model is not able to see now. Let's go to uh, another one, another BERT model, but this is BERT cased. So both of these models were released together. And this one preserves, it's only different in that it preserves capitalization. So we have the first capital letter in English and then capitalization. So this word is broken down into about eight different tokens and it's preserved in all caps. We still have the unknowns. We don't, the model really doesn't see these tokens. And then we can move on to another model. So let's see how GPT-2 does. And the first thing we can see here is that the new lines are back. So the GPT-2 model encodes or has the new line character as part of its tokenizer. And so we can see the, the text is broken down into the lines that it was originally made up of. We can also see that it does capitalization well. So we have both the capitalization at the beginning of the word as well as the 
all caps word here. One interesting thing to see here is that instead of the two characters, the emoji and the Chinese character, we have these six different tokens. So what happened here is that the model broke down each of these characters into multiple tokens. And the important thing to see is, do these three really able to reconstruct that same token? And we can see that in this new function here. So this function, encodes and then decodes the model, the text. And we can see that, yes, if you indeed merge these three partial tokens together, you reconstruct the original um, token. And so that's really a feature of this form of, of tokenization. So this is byte information uh, that is used in GPT-2's byte pair encodings or BPE tokenizing. So oh, these are a few interesting things to see in the GPT-2. Let's see what uh, Flan T5 does. This is another popular model that is based on T5, but it's uh, instruction tuned. So it's a great model. It preserves the capitalization, but then again, we lost the new line. Flan T5 is based on, it fine tunes T5. So a lot of these behaviors can possibly be attributed to the original T5. Uh, we lost the emoji, we lost the Chinese character. So this is not, let's say, a multilingual model. At least it doesn't have support for maybe Chinese or for emoji. We will see later why else if or E-L-I-F, the code word in, in, in Python. It's not great that it's broken down to three tokens. We'll see later why that is. But this is the, the, the quick look at Flan T5. Now, let's look at uh, GPT-4 before we do these other two models. So if we say GPT-4 and try to run it with some additional code, we can see it behaves kind of similarly to GPT-2. It's not really all that different. So it handles both the tokenization uh, of capital letters and capital words quite okay. It breaks down the individual tokens of the emoji and the Chinese character into these several tokens, but it's also geared, so this is a model that's geared for code. And so you can see that the code keywords here or um, characters that are often used in code are preserved each individually as an individual token. So none is an individual token, lf is an individual token, equals equals, larger than and equals l, so all of these are sort of preserved. Interesting place to start to start to see tokenizers that uh, are good for code use cases or not are how they deal with you know the tabs and the spaces. And this is one thing we can see differently here. The four spaces are encoded as this token. And so this token has let's say three, I think, spaces, and then this is an additional space that is tagged to. So this is a property of a tokenizer that deals with code that helps the model deal with code better. So if you will see that with LLMs that focus on code reading or generating code, this is one of the important uh, tricks or heuristics to build these models because indentation is an important piece of the code structure and the information that's uh, in the code. And in fact, you can see that with GPT-4, so let's say if you give it the text, uh, so we did the, so this is five spaces and that five spaces is this token, token number 257. What about six spaces? It also has a specific token, seven, eight. I think up until, I've tried this up until maybe 72 or something like, this is, you know, so many different spaces and, you know, there is one token specifically to this number of spaces. That's all for code support. So that's one example of tokenization that tells you about the purpose of the model, but also the data set that it was trained on. And you can see this again with StarCoder. So StarCoder is a open source model that is also geared towards uh, code. So we can see the four spaces also have their specific token, which is token number 264 here. Two tabs, each of the tabs has its individual token. And then otherwise it's pretty similar to GPT. One thing that is different is the numbers. So we go a little bit uh, in depth here in the book, 
But basically you can see that this string is, is like this. Let me pull it back up again. So this is the piece of text that we're encoding. So it's 12.0 times 50 equals 600. And you can see GPT-4 tokenizes it in this fashion. So the 12 is one token, the dot is one token, the zero is one token times 50 equals 600. So there's a token for 600. And this is one difference between GPT-2 and GPT-4. GPT-2 would do this a little differently. But contrast what GPT-4 does with what Starcoder does here, where every digit is its own token. So you can go back and forth at, you know, which way is better. You sometimes get the sense that this is possibly a better way to represent numbers. Because as numbers grow, as you start to have the model represent thousands and millions, uh, it becomes maybe a little arbitrary for the model to keep track of that if it's broken down into, you know, if one million is broken down into five different tokens, where one token is like one, two, five, and another token is like zero, zero, and another token is like zero. It's just harder for the model to really keep track of these arbitrary tokens. That's the hypothesis. Um, and so you start to see tokenization approaches where, you know, each digit and through breaking it down like this, the model is sort of forced to always keep track of numbers by looking at individual uh, digits rather than having something that's, you know, some strange behaviors. So let's, let's look at an example of how with GPT-2 we can encode these two numbers. Uh, let's say GPT-2, let's say we give it 850 and then 851. And you can see that 850 is one token, just token number this. Uh, but 851, the number right after it, is broken down to these two uh, numbers. And so the representation inside the model of this number is these two tokens, where it's 8 and then 51, and it's kind of arbitrary. While with something like Starcoder, if you give it this same thing, you give it to the model in a consistent manner where you're breaking it down into the individual digits. Galactica is... One of my favorite tokenizers. It might be worth doing a full video on the tokenizer for Galactica. I will show you just how it deals with this uh, example, but there's so much to unpack about this awesome tokenizer. We talk about some of it in the book, but just a quick glance at how it um, processes this text shows you that it's similar to these code examples and how it deals with them. One difference here is that the two tabs have their own token. So there's a specific token for one tab and there's another token for two tabs, which is possibly an optimization for code, just like the other um, code models, but they didn't really focus on tabs, this one did. They might be doing other you know, pre-processing where they turn tabs into spaces, that's possible. Maybe if we look deeper into the paper, some of these um, can, can come up. But there are so many other things other than this string for what Galactica does well and what inter very interesting ideas that it presents in adding specific tokens to tackle different kinds of information and data sets. So definitely one of my favorite tokenizers absolutely worth checking out. Uh, check out the book for more detail on that. So this was a quick look at a number of different tokenizers. I hope it gives you a sense for how different tokenizers treat different use cases and how different trained tokenizers behave differently based on their training data set and the model needs. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.